And now we are going to move on to our main topic here on Mastering Dungeons, which is checking out other role-playing games. If you have been following the show in the last few weeks, you know that we have been looking at other games and comparing them to Dungeons & Dragons to look at the mechanics of these other games as, as a way of not only spotlighting other games, but to show how they contrast with the rules and the setting and the play style of D&D. And we are having Rich on the show because he did something that not many others have done. What he did was take the 5e rules and rather than change the rules, he changed the setting. And then the rules that would change based on the setting that followed. What Rich did was create Esper Genesis. Uh, I am going to step back now, Rich, and I'm going to let you explain what Esper Genesis is. Esper Genesis is... Well, we we like we like to say it is fifth edition sci-fi. It is a definitive set of rules based off of its own setting and build that is mechanically, uh, you know, mechanically familiar to any five E player. Uh, that that was that was one of the goals. So you can you can pick up any of the Esper Genesis books, open them up. And the mechanics and the and the terms and the themes, everything in there is completely familiar. And that was the second part of the goal is that's where the familiarity ends. You will know how to play Esper Genesis as soon as you pick up the book if you have ever played D&D. However, it is not D&D. It, it, it feels it feels different. It's it's a it's a different um, it's a different brand of of game. And if you're a sci-fi fan of a multitude of different sci-fis, a multitude of different sci-fi settings or stories, then you'll see something familiar uh, in Esper Genesis. It's it's almost like a it's like an amalgam, big sci-fi sandwich of of really cool things that is uh, that is science fiction. Mm -hmm. And I we did this because you know. D and D, we we we've seen the the additions coming out, and one of the one of their goals have always been to make everything as broad as possible for fans of fantasy and magic, and you know we wanted to do the same thing for for science fiction, just you know give you a set of tools that that allow you to make. Things like Star Wars or Star Trek or Mass Effect or, you know, Undar the Barbarian or, you know, <laughs> whatever, whatever comes to mind, you can open it up. And if you love D&D, &D, you're like, I can do this. And that, that was, that's the main focus behind it. Yeah. So when did you come up with this idea for doing a science fiction setting with the 5e rules? Uh, started about about five years ago, <laughs> six okay. years ago, six years ago. Now uh, you mean exactly when? No, no, no. no. Uh, so I, I actually didn't really, I, I, I came up with the idea with help. I made a bunch of, of sci-fi gear for, uh, for, a, you know, our 5e game and presented it to people, you know, thinking that I did something cool. Hey, look, I did this, you know, I did this awesome thing. Take a look. And, you know, the first two people I showed it to was, what are you going to do with this? It doesn't belong anywhere. And that was the, you know, the light where, well, I need to make something where this stuff fits and, and belongs. And it uh, spiraled into this uh, at first out of control thing that, you know, I, I bundled up together and came up with basic rules for uh, for Esper Genesis and made sure that I, you know, showed everybody that I could. Uh, we, we brought kind of the basics out to uh, to Metatopia one year mm -hmm. to, you know, set it up in front of people that are familiar with D&D &D and, and the game designers that were there just to see what the acceptance would be mm -hmm. of such a thing because at the time it was you don't do you don't do that you don't do sci-fi and <laughs> yeah and D, D and it was very well received so we just kept going yeah just so people know metatopia and correct me if i'm wrong is sort of a reverse convention 
Mm-hmm. Right. It's you go there to play test games if you're a player and you go there to play test your game as a designer, but you also have the chance to play with other designers in a sort of workshop environment. So you can review their game, they can review your game, and and it's a it's a pretty interesting uh, way to look at a convention and look at game design workshopping. Yep, it's a it's a wonderful convention because you're uh, the the person that's going in there used to play games is the presenter, and the designers that are there, you know, are there to give you you know, as much advice as possible, as much help as possible. They've been through exactly the same thing that, that you're going through when you show up there. So yeah, if, if you're, if you're planning on, on going, you know, deep into design, I highly recommend going to at least one of those. Awesome. Now you said feedback was pretty positive. Metatopia is also, it's not like a D and D convention, right? It's, it's no. a, it's, all different sorts of role-playing games, even board games and, and things like that, if I remember correctly. So did you get any, like, why are you using 5e D&D questions? Yes. <laughs> and, and what was your answer? I did. Uh, well, I, I, my first answer was, you know, uh, the, the game is a is a collection of all of my favorite things from my childhood and D was one of those things uh so you know that it lends itself to well at the time you know D was was still growing but it was the game you know after after 5e came out that everyone was familiar with mm-hmm. and i wanted to create something that isn't you know when you when you open up a new game and then there's two sides of things right there there's the there's the mechanics and then there's the setting and then you're trying to when when you're learning the mechanics i mean sometimes it's a good thing you know when you when you have a new game when you when you're learning the mechanics and it flows into the setting but there's still that learning curve and you know i i actually enjoyed 5e so much you know when it came out it was it was like malleable after uh, after looking through it hard enough <laughs> to where I wanted that easy familiarity for everybody already playing D anD D to to go ooh and then be able to say I can take anything from my D anD D game or I can take anything from this game and I can throw them together because honestly part of you know part of sci fi is fantasy part of sci fi is able to take fantasy elements and throw them in. So that's that's why I went that route. I bet you were a big fan of Barrier Peaks. Uh, I the, was a, the, yes. the old uh, the old sci-fi D and D adventure from A D and D days. I was a it was probably one of my favorite adventures. Um, one of our current Kickstarters is like a spiritual sequel to that adventure. Mm-hmm. You know that has its own you know fantasy and and sci-fi mishmash and. Uh, that expedition from the mysterious peaks it's it's a sequel uh from the view of the sci-fi characters that uh that go there so yeah barrier peaks was great uh it was a big star frontiers you know and alternity uh you know the star drive game i i i jumped into all of those as 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 much as possible i i love that as much as i love the fantasy elements okay so so you you have five e the rules you really love, you have science mm-hmm. fiction a the the genre the setting or settings throughout the years that that you've loved, uh, and then you you try you marry the two. What were some of the tough game design decisions that you were confronted with as you did this? Uh Probably the very first is is to not look at anything, <laughs> anything even modern or sci-fi related that someone else might have already been working with or or doing. I, I just I shut it all out. I'm like I'm not I'm not gonna look at anything. I'm just gonna do this my own way. And you know because I I wanted to remain consistent. A a um a popular trend for. Uh, especially now 
for people that uh, that do design for uh, D and D. Actually, I guess this was this was a popular trend before, and it was popular, you know, even during the three point five. Is they took the main rule system and they broke it down into parts, and then they just kind of like tailored the base of the game to whatever they had found was cool and 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 you know and re-released it and it's like well you know it's it's 5e but i changed this and i changed that and i changed this core mechanic and i changed that main thing and i'm like well then it's not 5e anymore is it you know (laughs) it's it's now something else that uses d20s that you're you know you're it's, it's being called 5e but it's really not and and uh the that was the the hardest thing was avoiding that was avoiding taking the base of the game and altering it so you know i i I needed to thematically change some core concepts but keep them so that they work so that they're compatible with everything that's already been released Mm -hmm. and then add whatever needs to be added and then keep those mechanics similar you know the the uh, the ship mechanics, the you know uh, space and and you know how to deal with with uh, vehicles. I, I wanted to keep those to where yeah, they're new rules, but they still use the same base concepts. You know, I you know I it's a it's a skill, it's a tool. Uh, you know the the tables kind of you know have like complications, and you go okay, you know I've I've seen this table for another thing I've seen in the DM's guide. Now that, that was the that was harder than I thought it would be. <laughs> yeah. So do you have the same sort of base system with races, with classes, with spells, with skills that that 5e has? Yes. Uh, the core manual, which is the player's book, presents the game the same way the D&D player's handbook would, uh, but with, you know with some with some tweaks right you know the uh the, the 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 powers the power system which is kind of like your spell system uh you know probably one of the major tweaks is you know the whole thing with you know spell books and spell memorization and things like that we tossed all that out so i doesn't okay. use any of that you know instead there's there's uh there's talent points and we uh, you know adapted the point system uh you know to do that but mechanically those function the same uh, we put in new subclasses to work with the the base work, uh, the framework of the main classes. Mm-hmm. We created new species to function with the sci-fi setting, just to you know separate itself completely from the fantasy element. And we built a whole lore, a, a whole like you know chain of lore and and a story and a meta plot behind everything that was happening. So. That way, you know, again, so that way it feels different. You're you're diving in with mechanics that you already know how to use, but you already know that you're not playing Dungeons and Dragons. Mm-hmm. You can, but you're not <laughs> you're not necessarily doing that. Uh, but then we we went into so the the technician's guide, which is kind of like our DM's guide. Uh, we wanted to expand on that. And that's where we put in the stuff that's okay, well. Uh, DM's Guide kind of has a a run of mechanics for a fantasy game. No, no, no. You know, these are all completely different. That's it's a very different book to where here's how you just kind of create any any species based off of what kind of planet you're from. Mm-hmm. You know, do you have a, a planet with like high gravity? Do you have a planet, you know, that's like a, you know, a, a metropolis in space? Do you have a, you know, and then then you're not stuck to the, you know, the the original race rules or the species rules. You can just sort of tailor your character based off of its origin, which I thought was cool. Mm -hmm. So you give players a way to build their own worlds within the, within the overall universal setting that you've created. Mm -hmm. We do Uh, the galaxy. Uh, so we we also had to we had to create a way to map a galaxy right that we had to scale out everything uh so where we're you know we can't focus on things like dungeons you know those those aren't a thing so instead we have a whole environment chapter that you know the atmosphere how to create 
um, structures and environments, how vision works in outer space, how, you know, space travel and using sensors. And, you know, we even put in some tables for, you know, here's how to build a random town that you roll into on a planet, you know, on a colony, you know, here's how to fill in information on planets. Here's random tables to build a star system. There are thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of star systems, you know, just roll a few dice and then you've got it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, has, has two suns, has, you know, three, you know, this planet has three moons. So that way you're never stuck there. There's a constant expansion. Cool. So one of the things that we talk about when we talk about other games is the concept of the game loop, which is when you're sitting down to play, how do turns work? How does a round work? How, you know, how does the game manage these systems of static, uh, static, what's the word I'm looking for? Just the, the way things are, then mm-hmm. what changes based on turns and then how to reassess what the consequences are of each turn. So since you went with a 5e system, did you mess at all with that, considering that now you have probably ray guns and you have you know, armor suits and you have these other elements that you need to deal with? Uh, in terms of, of the way that turns work, we tried... Uh, I tried to keep the the way time functions the same, so it's still uh, rounds and turns and minutes and hours, and we we sort of give like a sci-fi reference uh, to that, since obviously you know you're not on Earth or a or an Earth type planet at all time, so you, re- you reference it in particular ways, but uh, at least you know even though some of the names are different, the concepts are the same, so the time runs exactly the same. Uh, probably the two things that we that we changed the most uh, was when we implemented ship combat. So uh, ship combat, when you have multiple crew members, the ship is your character, and the crew members, their stats, depending on what role they're in, messes with the the base stats of the ship. So you know the the pilot's dex and the wisdom and the, you know, the captain's charisma and all of those things modify the ship's stats. And then in combat, when the ship goes, the crew has maneuvers and they all and they all discuss and and they go. And that's that's probably the the biggest change that we made uh in ships is is everybody kind of goes through as as a team. Everybody moves as a team and the ship makes uh functions, you know, with team decisions. But it still works in a combat round. That that was uh, so. That familiarity is still there. One ship goes in its uh, during its initiative. Another ship goes during its initiative. And if you really, really wanted to, in that same initiative order, two ships go, and then a group of characters go, that are on a planet or on one of the ships or on, and then you can run the entire combat in the same initiative order without. Without shifting, um, without having to have two separate comments. So that that takes care of the old Star Trek problem of there's a problem on the ship and a problem on the planet, and the, yep. everything needs to work together to solve both problems or one problem helping solve the other. I like that. So could you this? Got those... Oh, go ahead. No, no, I, I was you know you got those TV episodes right, the Star Trek TV episodes where you know the. The ship's getting beat down, and then something has to happen on the ship in order for everybody to survive the ship battle. Right? Somebody in engineering has to do something. Or that's 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 the feel I was looking. For. So, how easy would it would it be able to port that ship combat system into your D and D campaign when you are, you know, doing an airship or or some other thing where the group needs to work together? Uh, so long as, well, we, we also have a, a ship construction system in the, in the technician's guide. So you can build any kind of ship. And if you thematically port that into airships, for example, and just give them, you know, different styles and different names. And, you know, as long as you keep the, the hit points and the mechanics and the weapons the same, or you can just use the existing stats that, you know, that are there and, and then, you know, theme them to your airship campaign should work pretty seamlessly, honestly. 
you know, there, uh, there are, you know, the only thing that prevents D and D characters from being able to fly a starship is the fact that they just don't know how mm -hmm. <laughs> that's it. Get a proficiency and you're good and everything functions the same. Uh, I, I was, I was thinking about doing something similar for, uh, Spelljammer, for example, mm -hmm. just kind of expand on that. I haven't had time to write it. <laughs> so, you know, going from ships to monsters, you, you have your core manual, which is the player's handbook, your technician's mm -hmm. guide, which is like the dungeon master's guide. Do you have a monster manual? And how different was it to create monsters in this uh, setting than you would for a D&D game? Uh, we do. It's it's called the Threats Database. It's probably the the biggest difference is that uh, the examples that I had to go off of were things from you know old sci-fi novels or comic books or movies, uh, things that have never really been adapted to D and D before, mm -hmm. and there isn't anything even thematically similar in the books. To compare them to so uh that that was you know i just had to come up with a way of tackling that creating the uh the stat blocks were were fun but it was a lot of fun because i was able to come up with just crazy things you know uh i i i you know made a uh a, a group of of robots that are sentient you know they, they're they're run off of an artificial intelligence but they exist in two places. The robots exist in physical space. And then there's the matrix where mm. their artificial intelligence dwells and those have stats. And, you know, taking that, taking that concept that isn't, uh, it doesn't lend towards, uh, towards fantasy at all. That, that was a nice thing to introduce. So can you in Esper Genesis take your small craft and fight a dragon? Yes, absolutely. That's and that would be a lot. That would be a lot of fun. <laughs> that's wicked cool, <laughs> is is what that is. Or fight Tiamat in in your larger craft. Uh, Ooh, that would take some. That would take some 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 number crunching. But okay, uh, that that would that would uh, that would work. Something like something like Tiamat. Well, I mean, something like Tiamat, for example. Uh, you know, it is is more you can definitely take your band of sci-fi characters and mm -hmm. and you know and fight tiamat but like so the starships all of that functions um it functions the same as as combat rules are but ships all have different sizes themselves mm -hmm. and they have what what we call hull points and it's really just hit points times 10 okay and like you know and, and then they have damage thresholds and so when I when I say you need when you, when I say you need number crunching, number crunching isn't difficult. you know that complicated. Yeah. But yeah, it's yeah, it's not that difficult at all. Uh, you can do it. It would just be like just the just the visual aspect of it is like oh okay. <laughs> when Tiamat does something to your you know something to your starship, you know I'll just you know I have to calculate some numbers, but that should be interesting. That's that's really cool. Uh, so any other lessons that you learned any tips that you have for wannabe game designers out there for taking a system as sort of ingrained as 5e and as tied to this fantasy realm and porting it over to something quite different uh probably the best advice that i could give is well, I, I guess two two main things. One is you know love what you're doing because you're you're gonna get the best out of that. But I think that's advice for any game design of any game. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing something in an already existing sandbox, like you know especially something as as ingrained as Five E, simple is better. Mm -hmm. That is uh, that I actually think was the goal of the Five E designers from the start. Uh, or at least I would assume so, you know, in, in compared to in compared to older editions, is that, you know, if you're introducing a new concept, if you already have an existing mechanic that makes it work, just use that mechanic. 
there's no need to to reinvent the wheel keep it simple and you know just it's just the way you describe it and you present it because in in the end like role playing going going back to the very beginning of our discussion mm-hmm. regardless of of uh of of like you know which dice hit the table for what skill or what what, what weapon in the end it is actually a narrative game mm-hmm. you know you're you're immersing yourself into a story into an adventure and that description alone changes everything that you're doing okay so we've talked about the core manual uh the technician's guide and the threats database are there other products available for Esper Genesis? We have uh, we do have adventures that are available on drive through. We are working on uh, Expedition from the Mysterious Peaks, which is which is its own sort of Esper Genesis combo five E fantasy uh, adventure path. We have things on the horizon. Uh, what we're looking at right now is we uh, probably a, a couple months ago we had launched our own community content program on on drive through so anybody that wants to get into espergenesis and design stuff can just you know take any of the mechanics out of the book and and you know create adventure content for for other people to play i was uh, really excited about that until until we actually get more books out uh, after expedition, I think the uh, the big thing that we're looking at doing is kind of like a uh, a a guide to the galaxy, mm-hmm. so to speak. That that introduces uh, kind of like a part part setting book, part Xanathar's guide mm-hmm. kind of thing. We're going to introduce a whole bunch of different concepts that exist in the 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 setting, and then new mechanics to go with it. So speaking of adventures, how do adventures flow in in esper genesis is it similar to D and in that you you know you have a few encounters and then short rests long rest that sort of rhythm yeah it works almost uh almost exactly the same well until you have to repair your ship that's a whole different deal <laughs> <laughs> that's that's downtime that's yeah that's downtime which another thing that we we introduced uh so there is the you know the encounters the adventures they work very similar you know thematically to to fifth edition we changed a little bit about on, on uh, how characters develop um you know magic items are not a thing they're not a sci-fi thing so uh instead we we tinkered with that system and created a more of like a mod system. There, there are mods for weapons. There are mods for armors to give armor properties. And then there are like you know special forms of sci-fi gear that you can use that are kind of magic items. But you know then we have your you know you can upgrade your your weapon or you can upgrade your suit of armor uh, depending on depending on its type. Uh, and you can also get cybernetics that uh replace any of those you can upgrade your vehicle you build a drone and you can upgrade that and we sort of incorporated all that into a a lifestyle chapter where you could spend downtime actually doing things so we 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 like that uh for for at least like the ability for you know for the gm to expand on a story while the characters do things and they can they can contribute to that. Awesome. So you mentioned uh, drive through. Is there any other place that you can go to buy these books or adventures? Yes, uh, they are uh, in in print. You can you can find them at your friendly local gaming store. And if you do not find them at your friendly local gaming store, you can go up front and and ask them to to place an order. You know, we we uh, they are in distribution. Our distributor is uh studio two publishing so you know if you uh really want to get it you know right away and and order some physical copies you can order it through them you can find our books on amazon as uh they order from studio two so yeah there there are multiple different avenues awesome so anything else that you want to talk about espergenesis 5e or anything before we close i am uh 
I am very interested in what in in in, in uh, the the path that uh, one D and D is going in. Mm-hmm. So you know, uh, just in terms of of myself, you know, uh, the the design that I did for for Esper Genesis was in lieu of being you know as compatible with what's out as possible, even you know even third party stuff. So. I, I, you know, whenever, whenever I see something new coming out for D and I always, always look to see, you know, and say, okay, is this still compatible with what's going on? And and that's that's going to be my my focus uh, going forward is, is yeah. how to how to keep that. Right now, it seems like it seems like a lot of the things that they're doing are, are character centric. Mm-hmm. So that uh, you know, gameplay. You know, even if you pull out like old five E stat blocks, you can still use them, which yeah. keeps value to everything. Yeah. Well, we're all keeping an eye on the <laughs> one D and D playtest packets and progress. Oh, yeah. To uh, would you consider publishing more under uh, one of these Black Flag or Orc or one of these other licenses? I I have. Um, I'm after the after the OGL thing mm-hmm. unfolded. Um, I you know I had a, a few serious discussions, and we were wondering if we were even going to bother with a license, uh, as you know we're uh, probably the other consideration that we're going through right now is is releasing our own sort of uh, uh, system reference document mm-hmm. for you know, the, the Espergenesis sci-fi stuff. And then how do we go about that? Do we put that under a license? All of these things are sort of, sort of in the air right now. Um, Black flag is, is definitely a consideration, but it's um, Mm -hmm. yeah, we're, we're still weighing that out. Yeah. And, and you're also on uh, roll 20, right? Yep. Yeah. You can, you can, we have our, our, actually all three books now, our compendiums are all 20. And we are working with Roll Twenty uh, right now. Uh, there's no <laughs> no timeline in place, but hopefully soon uh, that we're we would we're actually going to have that compendium uh, to be um, interchangeable with with everything else that's that's in that's in the Five E compendium, which was the goal of Esper Genesis to begin with. So that would broaden a lot of a uh, lot of options. Forward. Wow, that that's a lot going on, Rich. So I want to thank you for taking the time to to co-host with me this week. Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for having me on. This was, Absolutely. This I also want to thank all our listeners. I want to thank our patrons who keep the lights on for us. A special shout out to our Master of Realms uh, patrons are in our show notes, and our Master of the Multiverse patrons. They get an extra special shout out on the show. So thank you, Graham Ward, James Walton, Matias Valero at Twin Portals, Joe Tyler, Krishna Simon says that I can't spell his name or pronounce it, Chance Russo at Drago Russo, Falcon Neal, Sean Molly, The Micro Ant, Eric Mengi, Post Fiction RPG Audio, Travis Lee, Brian King, Sean Hurst, Paige, or Ben, let's do it in the reverse order, Paige Lightman and Ben Heisler. Andy Edmonds at Nerdronomicon, Robin Dermy, Darren Chandler, Evil John, Steve Bissonette, and Craig Bailey. Thank you to all of those who are supporting us through our Patreon. If you would like to support the show, please consider supporting us at our Patreon at patreon.com slash masteringdnd. You can also leave reviews of the show on Apple Podcasts or on YouTube. So, Rich, where can people find you and your work? Uh, you can find me on uh, on Twitter. I am at Skydon1, Skydon and the number one. Uh, you can find uh, our game at uh, espergenesis.com and our other products at alligatoralleyentertainment.com since uh, we do publish uh, some some other five E content and and other games aside from Genesis, including uh, Witch Hunter: The Invisible World. True story. Uh, you can you can uh, find find me uh, on uh, Instagram at Esper Genesis Five E, 
And I think that's all I have. Right now. <laughs> All right. Well, you can find me on Twitter at Sean Merwin, and you can follow the podcast on Twitter at Mastering D&D. We're also on Mastodon, the show at Dice Camp, and me at Tabletop Social. And you can, of course, always go on to Patreon and onto YouTube to find us here. So now, Rich, we have wrapped up our look at Aspergenesis. What are we going to do now? Uh, we're going to go and kill some sentient robots. There's nothing better. <laughs>